Hi, welcome to this tutorial on using the Make software tool to automate your workflows and make them more reproducible. We're here in the BCE Virtual Linux machine and we're going to go ahead and download the materials for, the, um, for this tutorial from the GitHub repository. So we're going to go into this uh, directory that has the materials and I'm going to go ahead and open up um, the HTML file that accompanies these materials. Okay, so first of all, what is Make? So Make was originally designed to as basically a tool for building and installing software, but it's also a very handy tool for basically automating any workflow. And the basic, basic context that you'll often be working in is that you'll have a number of steps, say of an analysis or some sort of project that you're carrying out, or a number of steps to create a presentation that you're, that you're making. And what Make will allow you to do is basically automate that series of steps, and it will take care of understanding um, that in many cases, the uh, output from an initial step is then used as the input for the next step, and so on and so forth through a series of steps. So given this context where we have a series of steps, um, the, what Make does, Make is the software, and what Make does is it processes something called a Make file with a capital M. And usually a Make file is actually explicitly named that word, Make file with a capital M. So a Make file is made up of a series of basically recipes for creating the various files that are, um, that are created as part of your workflow. So here we have an example of what's called a rule. And a rule has um, basically three components. The first component here is the name of the file or the output that's going to get created. The second component after the colon is a list of any input files that the output file depends upon. And the final step, the final piece is in using uh, shell script commands, is the rule or the recipe by which the output is made from the inputs. A couple things about formatting. The formatting is very strict. It has to look essentially just like this with the colon and the spaces. And each of, this, of the lines of the recipe need to have a tab uh, and, then, and then start out with the first letter of the command here. So this can't be done with, uh, with spaces. Okay, so that was um, a single... So this is a single recipe that would be used to create a PDF file from a LaTeX document, as well as input an in, another input document with the tables and some PDFs that are that are um, that are that are used to make the the um, some input PDF figures that are used to make the output PDF. If we wanted to create um, a make file that has the entire say workflow for creating this paper, it might look something like this. Here's an example uh, make file for a short but complete workflow. So we've seen that we have one rule for, and, and the, these, the double um, pound signs here don't appear in the make file. This is just in the formatting of, that was created in, that was generated in creating this HTML. So the first rule is for creating make pa mypaper.pdf from the input tech files and the bib tech file and the other input PDF files. And there might, for example, be three other uh, rules. So for, suppose that you have some input data in data.csv and in order to make the figures that you're going to put into your paper you need to do a little bit of processing and perhaps some analysis of that and in this case we're going to, we, we might suppose that we're using the, the software R to do that. So that step might, it would be encapsulated as creating a results.rda, this is a binary output file using these input files, a data file and a code file, and then the recipe would be to run R on that code file to then, um, that would then uh, produce the output in results.rda. And then another two uh, recipes or steps might be that you are gener going to generate some, some PDFs using R using, the, um, using what is contained in the results.rda data file. So you might have a step to create figure1.pdf using a code file and that results data file and then here's the recipe for doing that and similarly for figure two. So if we want to if we want to um, run this entire workflow all we need to do if we're in the directory that contains all of these files and as well as the as the make file that contains this this text here is just type make at the command line. So let's go ahead and uh, try that. We're going to see that in the make file here in 
our working directory on, uh, on in the terminal um, that we ha indeed do have this exact um, we have this ex the, we have this exact make file that we've just seen in the HTML. So now, if I want to go ahead and run that workflow, I can type make. And it's going to go ahead and run the various things and then return the command line to us. And we should see if we do ls minus l, we should see that just now, in the last few minutes, um, all of these, um, in fact, if we do ls minus lrt, we'll see it in time order. We can see that just in the last minute or so, all of these files, which are basically all of the output files that are specified in the, in the make file, were just created. Um, the same the same thing is just printed here in the HTML, and you can see that actually make went through and did these did these four carried out these four rules um, in the correct order, uh, and and that's because make recognizes which output files are input files for another uh, step and does and 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 carries out the rules in the proper order. So you can see the first thing it did did was it ran the code in model.r to and that was the one that produces results.rda. It then ran the two pieces of code that create figure1 and figure2.pdf and then only after that did it run pdf latex to create the paper. And if you were to scan through the voluminous output here you would see that indeed it actually did run this full recipe here with the three calls to PDF LaTeX and the single call to BibTeX. Okay, so let's scroll down here uh, past all of this output. Um, and then the last thing I want to comment on at the moment is we don't actually have to run the entire set of, uh, of rules. We can run individual ones and the way you would do that is that you would do something like this. You would just say make and then give it the name of the target of the thing you want to make. So ignore this, um, this touch command. I'll explain that in a second. Um, but if we want to just go ahead and create a single one of, run a single one of the rules, create a single one of the outputs, I can just type uh, make and then the name of the output that I want to create. And you can see it just runs the recipe for that particular rule without running all of the other rules. Okay, so why is it that um, I needed to, to, to type touch figure1.r? So the basic reason is that make only runs a recipe when any of the, um, the input files uh, have changed. And the nice thing about this is that that means that um, if you have a lot of different steps in your workflow, make is not going to rerun every single one of those when only a single thing changes. It's only going to rerun um, the recipes um, that depend on either directly or indirectly that depend on the file that was changed. So that use of touch here was just basically to make um, make think that the file had changed by basically it changes the, the timestamp on the file. And then when I did make figure1.pdf, it thought that since one of the in, one of the input files, one of the prerequisites for figure1.pdf had changed, it therefore uh, was happy to go ahead and uh, run the run the recipe for creating figure1.pdf. Now, if I tried to do that again, to just do make figure1.pdf, the result that I would get uh, is that it says figure1.pdf is up to date because according to because make uh, sees that none of the prerequisites for making figure1.pdf have uh, have actually changed. Okay, next let's see a more extended example of a make file for automating a workflow. So you might imagine the sorts of things that would be involved in, say, an analysis workflow. You might have to get the data, do some pre-processing, do some analysis or statistical modeling, some post-processing. You might then make some figures and tables and then create a presentation or a paper. The idea is you could put all of the steps of this workflow in your, your make file. And so this, uh, the file that, the example I'm going to show you is uh, in, the, in the file make file underscore analysis. So I don't actually have all the, the input files needed for running this. This is just meant as an example make file and not one that you could, that you could actually run. But let's take a look at the syntax and, and uh, see what some of the features of this make file are. So first of all, you'll notice that there are a lot of variables that are defined here with these equal signs. And the idea of variables is just like variables in any language um, that they're used to um, uh, create some abstractions and uh, save you some some time and energy. So as an example here, um, my workflow is going to, involve, going to involve calling R, the software R a number of times, using the R command batch syntax. 
and, in, in, and also it's going to involve using this minus minus no save flag. So I'm actually going to define some variables that encapsulate the, the command, the full syntax for, for running R, and I'm going to call that, I'm going to name that a variable called R. And then you'll notice that later on in the make file I use the variable R with the syntax with the dollar sign and then parentheses around the name of the, of the variable. And that way I don't need to keep retyping R command batch and if I want to change the options that are, that are used for R, I can always just change them uh, in this R ops uh, variable. So that's an example of using variables. You'll notice some other variables up here where I decide at the top of the file to just define some of the names of uh, files and some of the names of different extensions that, that I make use of. Another thing that, um, so that's a little bit about using uh, variables in make files. Another thing that, uh, another feature of you know, this make file to point out is that there's, um, there's a type of rule called a pattern rule. So, so far, we, the rules that we've seen are all basically what would be called explicit rules. So they're all, they're all um, they, have ex, they have particular explicit um, targets and particular explicit prerequisites and then particular recipe. But we can also define what's called a pattern rule. So if you remember from the earlier simple example, I had a recipe for creating figure 1.pdf and a recipe for creating figure 2.pdf. And those recipes were basically identical, except in one case it was figure 1 and in one case it was figure 2. You can imagine you might have figure one, figure two, up through figure 20, and you wouldn't have to write, want to have to write out the rule for each one of those explicitly. So a pattern rule allows you to encapsulate that and avoid, avoid having, uh, repeating your code, which is often, often the source of bugs and errors. So the pattern rule looks like this. Basically, the percent sign is a wild card that then gets filled in, and, and, and this is used to define the rule for anything that is, say, of the form figures slash figure and then something dot pdf. So suppose you've got a number of figure files in, a, in the capital figs directory. This would say that for any one of those as a target, the input is in the code directory r and is of the form figure and that same uh, wildcard dot r. So the prerequisite for say figure one dot pdf would be figure one dot r. The prerequisite for figure two dot pdf would be figure two dot r, etc. And then results.rda is a prerequisite for all of the figure, uh, figure of the files of the form figure something PDF. And then here's the um, here's the recipe for creating the figure.pdf. Um, and in this case, I use a couple special variables. So this dollar sign ampersand refers to the first prerequisite in the prerequisite list. So this is saying run r that r command batch on the appropriate figure um, dot r, and then the output of our command batch is going to be to take the target name, and that's indicated with the at here. And this syntax here, basically what this syntax does is it takes the target name and replaces dot pdf with dot r out. So if I had a, a target of figure one dot pdf, this rule would say run our command batch on figure one dot pdf and have the output be um, the output from our command batch be figure one dot r out. Um, of course, in the actual R code, it would presumably be actually generating uh, figure one dot pdf as the as the target of this um, as the overall uh, in, in, in consistent with that being the target of this overall recipe. A couple other things to notice here. You'll also notice that um, you can use star to indicate wild to be wildcards, just as in, in Unix in general. So this would say that the prerequisites for the web target are anything ending with .pdf, anything ending with .tech, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and there's often um, a target called clean, and that just basically cleans up interim files. So in this case, the recipe for the clean target is to just remove a bunch of things, and we could refer back to the interims variable to see that the interims. Uh, the interim files are anything that end in .aux, .bbl, .blg, etc., etc. Okay, so that's that's a basic example of a more involved uh, make file, uh, and what it does is it creates this uh, PDF as sort of the final uh, target. But the the other steps are it goes and grabs some data from the web, it does some pre-processing of that data in Python, it does some analysis in R, it creates some tables using R. It creates some figures using R. 
Uh, it then, um, in the web target, it copies the resulting analysis as a zip file to a particular web server, and then there are these clean targets that will clean up all the interim files that were created uh, along the way. Okay, next let's, let's look at an example of, you, of a makefile that uh, might be used for creating a presentation materials for a workshop. Um, I, in the course of doing this, I'll also illustrate the use of what are called nested makefiles, where one makefile where, um, where one makefile basically calls another makefile. So in the tutorial materials, you'll see that in the workshop underscore example directory, um, we can change to that here. And we can see that there's a makefile here and then a module subdirectory. And this initial top-level makefile basically is just there to then call the makefile in the subdirectory. So that doesn't help us all that much in this context, but in, in other cases where we have more complicated things going on, it can be useful to, to be able to call makefiles in subdirectories. So I did want to illustrate that here. So let's go ahead and go into the modules directory and then we can see the make file that does the real meat of the work uh, here in the modules directory. And that's exactly the same as in the HTML. So let's look at it in the HTML. So here it is um, starting here. Okay, so a few things to notice about this make file. Again, there's a clean recipe, uh, in this case up here at the top. Um, and there's an all target. And that all target is basically defining um, if we wanted to it's basically defining that this will be this is uh, what would be done if we wanted to carry out the entire um, all of the steps of of making this uh, presentation. So that would do a, a make clean call. Then it would then it would call make on all of these various targets. And these are basically just defined these targets of zero one through up through eleven. They're basically just shorthand um, targets. And I basically just created them so that I could type something like. Uh, make zero instead of having to, for example, type make module underscore zero, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's a lot, a lot easier, obviously, just to type the name of the, just to type the actual number. So I've def defined a, a whole bunch of these auxiliary uh, targets down here, and then you'll notice I have a pattern rule that's used for. Um, a pattern rule that's used for uh, for creating any one of these uh, 12 different HTML files. So the pattern rule basically says the input is of the form.rmd, the out the target is there, the prerequisite is the form.rmd, the target is of the form.html, and then this is the recipe that uh, is used to uh, to create that HTML. And in this case, that actually calls another uh, Bash shell script called Make Slides that carries out the um, the creation of the of the HTML. I could have actually just embedded the the code that's in Make Slides in um, in the Make file. Um, uh, well, potentially I could have. Uh, actually, it's um, it's an R script, so I guess uh, it, I guess it makes sense that I have it as a separate script that's callable from the from the Bash uh, command line. Um, but anyway, this R script is, is what does the, what does the processing of this RMD file, which is an R markdown file, to create the, the resulting HTML file. Okay, so I'm going to close with a few more minutes of talking about some of the more advanced features of Make. So first of all, there are a lot of details about some of the um, specifics and complexities of how you define variables. So... Um, there's actually a distinction between using this colon equals called set equals and just using a plain equals. And, and that distinction um, is basically in when the variable gets, um, when the variable assignment occurs. So if you use a set equal, then the assignment to the variable occurs um, basically at the point at which the, um, at which the variable is defined in your, in your make file. Whereas if you just simply use an equals, then that assignment doesn't actually occur until uh, make gets to a point where it actually needs to use the variable that is being defined in some sort of command. So the result of that is if you look in makefile underscore variables, you'll see an example like this where I define a variable foo1 and that's equal to some other variable bar called bar1, but bar1 has not actually yet been defined. And that's fine if you use just a plain equals because as long as you use foo1 down here, in your in your make file, um, then 
uh, foo one is only going to uh, make is only going to try and figure out what foo one is at the point that foo one is used in a in a rule, and and at that point, um, hopefully bar one will have will have been defined at that point. On the other hand, if you were to use the set equals, then make will try and um, basically uh, define basically assign to foo two the value of bar two. Um, at this at this point, when foo two is actually uh, defined, and if bar two doesn't exist at that point, then you would then um, then you'd have um, then nothing would get assigned to foo two. So we could go ahead and run the make file variables um, make file and see how this all works. And I'll let you do that uh, on your own. Um, but I will comment here something I skipped over before. If your make file is not simply named make file. You can tell make to use a make file by a different name by just saying make minus f and then passing the name of the make file that you'd like to have it to have it use. Okay, and then the last thing I'll mention is that um, make provides a number of functions that you can use, and often these uh, functions are used for basically doing string manipulation. So, for example, there is a um, there's a, uh, a, a function called subst for substitute, and what that will do, what that would do, for example, in this case, is in the variable file, it would substitute anything that any cases where there's an MD with an HTML. So the result of, of supplying substitute to file um, with these arguments would be to turn workshop workshop.md into workshop.html. Similarly, uh, there's something called pattern substitution. Um, and that would allow you to work with wildcards like these percentages here. And so that should turn anything of the form mod something.md into the equivalent mod something.html. You can also sort things in an input variable. And then there are some functions that are basically amount to dealing with the, um, the extensions of file names and the directory names of, um, of paths to files. So you could, for example, pull out the directory associate, uh, for anything in, in, a, in this variable input files using the dir function. You could pull out the suffixes of the, or extensions of the of file names using suffix, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, if you run uh, make on make file functions, you'll see, um, you'll actually be able to run um, this make file and see how each of these functions work uh, for these particular examples. So I'll leave that to you to do on your own, and with that I'll conclude um, this screencast.